Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let me first uh, thank the organization committee, uh, where I identify especially Andre, who was my former student, uh, now a brilliant entrepreneur, and which makes me really happy. And it also um, gives me uh, uh, satisfaction, uh, very high satisfaction being in this uh, audience with very young people and new faces. So, um, and I'm going to speak uh, today about how Microsoft views Portugal as a top destination to uh, R&D uh, labs, software labs. So, uh, I will start with a Microsoft overview. So, just for us to understand how, how this company that started small uh, is now today. And we could then understand how Portugal fits in the big picture. Um, and we are going, I'm going to speak a little bit about distributed development because that's what it's all about. It's to have distributed uh, talent and distributed engineering around the globe. Um, and then I will focus in uh, some criteria, four criteria that led Microsoft to really select Portugal as a location for, for the lab, which is about the language and our culture, which is about R&D uh, of our country in this area, and it's about the access to talent and some country factors which are also important. Then I will uh, go through some uh, MLDC activities, MLDC stands for Microsoft Language Development Center, and some challenges that we still face as as a country in this area, and I will drive some conclusions. So today we are around 98,000 uh, full-time employees in this company, with with some more support, so reaching around 174,000 persons working globally for Microsoft. And Microsoft, um, uh, that we know, uh, is really a different set of organizations. And we have really three different types of organizations in the company that really work close together. In fact, we have re really this um, way to collaborate uh, uh, globally towards a common goal. We have a long-term organization, a long-term research and innovation organization. We have a, a product group organization that do, does more mid, uh, short to mid-term R&D. And then we have the sales and uh, marketing organization. So, let me speak briefly about the long-term organization. We, are, we hire the top talent, and we are around 1,000 globally in, in various places around the globe. So, we call it our internal research, and we are uh, based in these locations. We also have an external research pro program where Microsoft funds uh, very promising academic uh, research projects. We fund breakthroughs. And we have uh, these uh, joint research centers, which are uh, examples. Uh, and we do collaborate with other companies and the open source community as well in this external research program. Actually, we, we produce open source uh, software out of these uh, uh, activities. We have also in innovation and technological transfer. So this is the long-term res research, 1,000 individuals working towards 10 years to 20 years visions. Then we have the product groups. So the product groups is an organization with three divisions, around 25,000 scientists and engineers that have a short to mid-term horizon. And we have the Microsoft Business Division, we have the Platform Products and Service Division, and we have the Entertainment and Devices Division. Today we've seen a very interesting talk of Carlos Oliveira. He sits in the Entertainment and Devices Division. My group sits in the Microsoft Business Division. So we see it's different organizations towards collaborative and shared um, uh, development envir environment. And then we have the subsidiaries, of course, the sales and, and, and the dissemination exploitation activities throughout the world. We are organized in uh, these five areas. In, in the framework, especially of the uh, product group divisions, uh, Microsoft really is now moving towards a model of global development, of distributed development. 
So we, we, we do need, and we are doing that, we are executing on that. We are now less Redmond-centric. However, we have 40,000 persons working in Redmond. But we are investing outside. And, and we have, you'll see how we are really doing this distributed development strategy. The benefits are the improvement of the quality of the products because we do local development for local markets. Um, European language is, is one example. My, we'll, you'll see how my, my development center demonstrated to the company that it's more useful, the quality improves if we do European language development in Europe, not in, in, in Redmond, not in China, not in India. And also we have citizenship uh, uh, um, teams, we increase our connection with the, with the companies, with the partners, and uh, with, with the citizens, and we invest in the local software economy. So you see what how this policy is evolving in Europe. We have around 16 and a little bit more of development centers in Europe. Uh, and we are happy to show you in this list two development centers in Portugal. So Microsoft Language Development Center was the first, started in 2005, <coughs> and um, uh, around almost two years ago, Mobicom was acquired, as you've seen. And so it's really a strategy, a clear set strategy in Europe to do local development. And we are speaking here of around 2,000 engineers and scientists uh, in, in this system. And in that overall environment, we've seen, uh, if I can go back. So we see here places like UK, we see Switzerland, we see Paris, we, we see Norway, Oslo, etc. And you might want to look at why Braga and why Porto Salvo uh, fit in this picture. Well, let me tell you about the top criteria, criteria selected by Microsoft, used by Microsoft to select Portugal as the, a local development center location. First, the Portuguese language. Second, the level of research and development <coughs> in language technology, Portugal uh, had demonstrated four years ago and consistently still demonstrates. The access third, the access to the talent pool in Europe and in Portugal as well, and some country factors. About the language, you know the, our importance. Uh, we are the third European languages. We are among the, the ten most influential languages in the world if we count of these factors, not just the number of speakers, not, not just the number of secondary speakers, but also the use of the language in major fields the economic power of the countries and the, the social literacy prestige, we are among the 10 most influential. So Portuguese is really important. Uh, and it's also, therefore, a strategic la language to Microsoft. As far as the R&D uh, in language technology, we have more than 15 years of experience. We have more than 10 active labs in this area. There are major public funded projects. Uh, we have an ecosystem of partners developing technology. In fact, in, in scientific domain, we have been uh, around the 10th European country in published papers in the major speech conference. So it's evident <coughs> that we are a player in that criteria. As for the talent pool in Europe, um, Microsoft, <coughs> when uh, hires, as some, some criteria to define what are qualified for interview um, engineers and computer scientists. And 13% of those from <coughs> the academia are in Europe. So 25% in, in, in China and 10% in India. You might think, is this real? It is. So of course, India and China produces much more uh, computer scientists, the level of expertise are uh, comparable to, to Europe. And for industry, Europe is in a better position. So China only has 4% and India 5% of qualified for interview under Microsoft standards. 
this clearly shows that there, there's an opportunity in Europe to hire talent and the opportunity for Portugal. <coughs> so, um, and, and, there, and also, so you see that there are more Grandin students from Europe than in the US. The ranking, if we go into the top 50 universities and the top 50 R&D institutes, Europe is very well positioned as well. What about Portugal? So we have around 3,800 new engineers per year. Well, computer scientists, information technology. 343 masters and around 100 PhDs. It's an interesting talent pool. Okay. And what about the country factors? Political and social stability, as we know. <coughs> the investment in R&D is interesting. It's now more than 1%. This is a really interesting figure for the country. We have cultural, climate, and society values as well. The labor laws are more or less f flexible enough in European space. And it's easy to attract European talent. Let, let me show you some, uh, some testimonies. If you like to read those, I like especially the, the first one by Jep, a Danish. So these are all um, compet computational scientists that work in my group. And you see that Jep says, because it's the European Union, you can attract highly qualified experts from a broad range of language domains with a minimum of logistical and bureaucracy fuss, and the surfing is red. So it gives us a, glan a glimpse of uh, the way we can attract talent in the European region. So that, therefore, in, in 2005, Microsoft Language Development Center was founded. Uh, the long-term mission was, is, uh, was and is to bring key language development for, for Europe uh, and uh, across all the European languages and beyond. Uh, we also feel that the Mediterranean region, the Latin American region is also covered. And so we have a, a nice multi-language, multidisciplinary, highly talented, highly motivated team. <laughs> and we work globally. So we have a group in Redmond, Redmond doing specially language, uh, speech language technology, another in Beijing doing specially synthesis. We are in Porto Salvo, we, we work with both, uh, and we have uh, another, another partners, and, and also including tell me in Silicon Valley. So we are globally, I, I have meetings every week. Uh, we are eight hours apart from Beijing and, and Redmond and Porto Salvo, and we do video conferencing every week, and it works. Making new languages is, of course, a data-intensive project process. Uh, it's it's uh, it's not just um, the standard uh, dialect, there are variants. So it's constantly ch it's changing. So it makes sense to have a product group that um, <clears throat> is in place to upgrade and improve the technology. And so we've done, we've developed the technology. We did for uh, speech synthesis systems uh, that will be distributed uh, in their markets. And we collaborated in around 15 speech recognition systems uh, across these 15 languages. And we have also programs, we call it citizenship programs, where we uh, give away to the community free bits that they can use which are language packs, which enable uh, developers to develop speech in, in their applications for free. <coughs> this, so I, I've shown you that <coughs> it has been a nice experience uh, to work in a distributed way. Uh, so we collaborate with our Beijing partners, with our Redmond partners, towards uh, an improvement in quality of, of the speech products we develop. But there are some challenges. If you look at the <coughs> following criteria, uh, where we think uh, um, regions and countries can be more or less ranked, and we, if we think of the availability of talent, including the, the numbers of the talent, 
namely of computer science and math graduates, their quality, which has to do with the ranking of universities, the level of uh, collaborative R&D, <coughs> the proficiency of English, the expenditure of, of, of public expenditure in these areas, and the access to talent, how the, the labor law uh, is set, some country factors like the cost of labor, but the cost of labor, you might think, okay, so that's why we go to China and India. But it's not really the most important. I have to tell you that the availability of talent and quality of talent are the most important factors, really. So if we add, we add all these factors, we can see <coughs> that there is still room to improve our country's position. So of course, India and China are India's first, China is second. UK is the first European country if we uh, weight these, these parameters. Israel is the 13th worldwide, so a small country could uh, put themselves in this position. Compare with our 17th, well, our 36th position worldwide, 17th in Europe. So Finland is the 14th worldwide. So Israel and Finland uh, looks as though they have a commonality. And it looks as though they have selected correct uh, policies uh, and correct uh, um, public-private uh, partnerships to achieve their goals. Portugal is better than some countries in Spain, Italy, and Poland, but still behind countries like Ireland, Belgium, Netherlands, Norway, Austria, Czech Republic, Hungary, Slovakia, Estonia. So we still need to, to work towards the improvement of our country as a destination of R&D investment from, uh, from foreign places, namely uh, large companies. And so as a conclusion, I can just uh, express my um, um, experience of the creation and the development of an R&D lab of Microsoft in Portugal, in integrated in an R&D framework uh, global, uh, globally that operates in Silicon Valley, Redmond, Porto Salvo, and Beijing. We are developing language technology for all uh, European markets, including Portugal, of course. Uh, and we are considered as a key asset of the company for these markets. Before our um, creation, these languages were developed in Beijing, in Redmond. With what we did, we brought that development back to, to Europe. And the result was a better quality of the products. And it, 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 Microsoft uh, really appreciates this. So we are a key value and a key asset for the company. Why Portugal? Well, I've shown you four factors. Language, R&D experience, talent access to Europe, including Portugal, and country factors. So, however, the Portuguese ranking among, amongst other uh, European countries still needs improvement. There, is, there are many public, um, I would consider many public initiatives that could be taken to improve this, this position, and it's a challenge for us all. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so um, our first products will be launched uh, next year. Okay, so uh, it's early to, to, to see the impact. So developed by, by my team, we will launch in Portugal, Denmark, um, Spain, um, and, and, the, and also Brazil. Okay, um, it will be, it, it, has, it has to do with the new launch of exchange. So exchange will have uh, like, like a virtual secretary where you can start a dialogue by telephone. Everybody will have his own personal secretary. And so we hope we'll create a big impact. So we might speak next year. Yeah. 
substitute. Uh, you know, this is a very hard question. Uh, no. I, I've done it myself, but the substitution of the keypad is still uh, very. Uh, well, that's uh, that's a good question. So speech is, is we consider the speech as a natural human computer uh, interface. So it goes along with other natural, natural modalities like gesture, for example. Uh, speech is having a big impact now and it's foreseen to have a big impact in the future in mobility scenarios. So we are, and not, not just Microsoft, other companies are really lo looking into the use of smartphones by speech. So we have, we are used now to use touch. We think that speech will be even more important. And, uh, and we, we believe it, it will be uh, an important growth in, in, in regarding applications. So there is, for example, a very nice application we call voice search. Not just us, other competitors do. And, and now we are experiencing an expansion of, of voice search the technology for many other languages other than American English. Well, thank you. Okay.